welcome to the very first episode of the tax walk and we have the most special guest a tax policy maker who's advised the finance minister and the government for over a decade a person who's been instrumental in shaping tax policies who's authored one of the most definitive reports the tax administrative uh, commission chairman dr parthasathi shom who's not only been a policy maker in india but who's also advised over 35 tax uh, jurisdictions uh, including uh, brazil has received the brazil's highest civilian honor and he's a phd in tax uh, you cannot interview a person more passionate uh, about taxation in the sphere of uh, policy making uh, thanks dr shom thanks so much for joining us uh, you have just and and i have mukesh bhai with us mukesh budani of bmr legal and it's going to be a great uh, uh, interview with uh, dr shoma my first question to you the one thing that you champion uh, for the last several years more than a decade is customer focus that the tax department needs to be more customer focused treat the taxpayer as customer when you see the prime minister narendra modi expressing dissatisfaction last week with the cbd chair person and the revenue secretary over the public Uh, redressal grievances uh, responses uh, over uh, the behavior of tax officers uh, does it in some way vindicate what you've been saying all along and is this probably also the first signs of some winds of change going uh, you are right i think that uh, customer focus is an area that indian tax administration has lacked um, and i also agree that the prime minister's statements time and again on uh, giving customers that is as tax payers the real importance and for the tax administration to respond to this need is not only a step it is a kind of movement in the right direction that is taking place the success of that of course would depend entirely on how the tax administration really responds to this issue and whether or not whether it is a bureaucratic uh, arrangement for some time or whether there's a sea change in the training approach and productivity of the tax administration in this direction dr shom you must be an extremely satisfied person whilst your term as a tarc chairman ended uh, particularly given the fact that you submitted the fourth report just days before the budget and more importantly the budget found a very specific mention about the trc recommendations and the new government's commitment to implement the trc recommendations your initial thoughts on that yeah i am uh, truly very satisfied with the statement that uh, the tarc uh, recommendations are in an advanced stage of consideration and that they will be implemented in the financial year 1516 uh, however i of course am awaiting together with other commission members as to in what manner uh, this whole set of recommendations and step wise in terms of uh, uh, importance and the functional areas in order to make all of this uh, really um, uh, successful in the field uh, will come forth i am convinced about the pol the good policy in intentions but i have to wait and see and then conclude whether really this uh, takes place in the field and whether the tax payer ultimately feels satisfied about it far ranging recommendations on yeah. a variety of issues i mean some of the recommendations split over 5 to 7 years of implementation if you were the decision maker if you were the finance minister what would be the low hanging fruits and what would you put in the medium to long term well first and foremost I think that the large taxpayer unit, which was not so successful, I think so far, um, the uh, LTU has to be reorganized. And following examples that we have from much of the world, create a large business service in which all the common functions between indirect tax and direct tax should be combined and implemented to the benefit of the good taxpayer. as well as for monitoring and internalizing the benefits of tax collection for both the departments that's a very low hanging fruit the institution of ltu is already there but it needs complete revamping and instructions to the two departments that this is what you do and oh, it is given what you do over as as you are saying year by year how you proceed so that is what second low hanging fruit is dispute resolution we have said how you really uh, reorganize restructure how you reduce the current stock 
how you introduce uh, conciliation and arbitration, which should be a, a requirement in the legislation. So again, that is a low lying fruit. So I mean, there are several of these that uh, I feel that we have given uh, directions for. Can, can I pick some specific themes, uh, Dr. Shum? Uh, you know, you start by saying uh, in the first report that at a macro level, the TAC found first that the Indian tax administration is in a vulnerable position uh, due to its static structure. Uh, are you suggesting, uh, Dr. Shom, that we are behind the curve, way behind the curve when it comes to our tax administration compared to the Western countries? Well, uh, unfortunately, I think that is correct because um, there is a 2012-2013-14 uh, followed up uh, OECD survey uh, of about 52 tax administrations where more than two-thirds and since then even more uh, of the tax administrations have really combined uh, their two branches of the tax administrations and operate as a consolidated tax administration. Now there is a, understandably I suppose, a lot of bureaucratic um, uh, static against it uh, indicating that we should, um, we are different and we have to, uh, we are more complex. But even uh, countries like Brazil, where uh, uh, geographically they are almost three times that of us and so on, they have done it. And so there is no reason why we shouldn't. And I think therefore we are behind the curve and we must not waste time. We must move ahead with it. But would it also be a little difficult, Dr. Shom uh, and Mukesh, because in some ways, now you have, earlier you had the indirect taxes contributing more than 60% of tax revenues. It's reversed now. It's direct taxes contributing 60%, IDD 40%, but it's still close to 50-50. So therefore, no one wants to let it go. Maybe if it were 80-20 someday, uh, you could have a bigger push no, to make no, that happen. Very interesting that you put it this way, because the distinction that we make between so-called direct and indirect taxes is uh, is on based on quicksand, because to, it is the business tax that we are talking about. Yeah. Business taxes include VAT, send VAT, if GST were to come and income tax. So this distinction doesn't exist. And in other countries, a, 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 a firm or a company that is paying these taxes are, they are all combined together and called business tax. And similarly, the tax administration looks at this as one umbrella. So they wouldn't say this is the indirect tax and this is the direct tax. And in our country, you know, it's like a pair of scissors. Indirect tax is to be more in terms of GDP then between 2003, 4, 2007, 8, if you look, then it crossed and direct tax through GDP became higher. Yeah. And then after that, after the eco global economic crisis, again, we because uh, income tax fell, we again raised excise duties and service tax rates, etc. So the, again, it has gone up. So, but this is this distinction is a misnomer, basically. So, um, because it is a business tax. Yeah. And because there are lots of common functions that we duplicate and yeah. waste human resources, hmm. which could be much better deployed in other areas, I think that it is high time that we really look at the combination, how to combine them and amalgamate them eventually in five to ten years. But begin the process of combining common functions as soon as possible. And all of these detailed intricate steps are of course there in the report. Dr. Shom, you've been very passionate about widening the tax space and the strategies country could adopt for widening the tax space. How do you view this as a larger macro objective in the context of budget proposals for 2015? So what the finance minister has done is, one, given a commitment uh, that he will reduce the corporate tax rate to 25%, imposed a tax surcharge on super rich, abolished wealth tax, brought a law which will help him collect some money through the black money uh, issue. How do you view these steps of budget of 2015 in the context of the larger strategy on widening the tax base? Each one of them is correct. And uh, I think that it does go uh, take a quite a leap forward towards expanding the uh, tax base because with lower rate of the company tax also you will have more investment you will have a larger tax base from which you will collect tax and so on um, however i think we also have to really push forward in expanding the taxpayer base uh, and that we have to do we have a burgeoning services sector and we haven't been able to do that as we have pointed out you know between uh, late uh, 
1990s um, uh, and, uh, uh, and 2005 6 you see that for 10 years we have uh, we increase our taxpayers from um, uh, 1.8 crores to 3.5 crores almost double since then in 10 years we have not increased it at all so we have to do that but Therefore, the taxpayer base is very important. As far as the tax base is concerned also, the decrease in the corporate tax rate is very, very important. The, the decrease provided we can also reduce incentives. Okay. So there are ways of tax, combining tax policy in the right direction. I think this administration is moving in that correct direction, but a lot more needs to be done. Dr. Shom, on dispute resolution, the first report of TAC uh, dealt exclusively uh, with uh, uh, the subject which has been a vexed issue now for many many years so uh, some recommendations have been accepted by the government like for example expanding the benches for authority on advanced ruling but i think your commission's focus was also on arbitration conciliation and mediation uh, but we saw that in the report beyond the mention that disputes can be sorted out outside of the court system mm. there wasn't much so we just wanted to, you know, kind of gather your thoughts uh, as to under alternate dispute resolution, how can we be more competitive as a country? Um, I think that um, you're right. We didn't delve too much uh, into it because we considered some of it a little policy orientation rather than administrative, if you see right. what I mean. However, we did have... Um, considerable discussions on it and uh, also as you know some very important cases are ongoing uh, whether it's the conciliation or arbitration and all that so we wanted to stay out of it uh, from that point of view as well however we did make the point and we have to, uh, uh, discussed with the government that we must have both arbitration and conciliation as a part of legislation on alternative dispute resolution. That is one of our recommendations. We, uh, then uh, individually we have given some notes on how to go about doing it. So uh, there is certainly a role for uh, 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 conciliation and arbitration because what is the final goal? It is not to take a position. Yeah. The final goal is are we going to get the weight of disputes down? Are we going to get resolution? Are we going to get the stock of disputes out of the, uh, get into the map and comparable to the rest of the world. Yeah. That is the objective. But Dr. Shum, how do we solve the sovereignty issue? You had the, 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 exactly. the joint the secretary. Foreign investors are asking a question mm. that in their minds, mm. alternate dispute resolution would in include India embracing arbitration. the concept of arbitration in its treaty. Now, India as a country has taken a view that we don't want to abdicate our judicial function. So the fundamental question that investors, particularly foreign investors have, is how do we now, when India talks about alternate dispute resolution, what does it actually mean? Because I think it will certainly require a change in our treaty policy. Yeah, I, I certainly think so. We have to compare on this matter ourselves. We have to benchmark ourselves with other capital importing countries. And by that, in that is included a lot of advanced economies as well. As long as you are capital importing, you are also capital exporting. And we are becoming like them. We have huge capital exports going on. We have a lot of Indian capital owners who are also taking money out. So we have to compare, compare ourselves. We cannot be, uh, sort of continue in an autarkic environment and just take a position. That's why in today's day and age, I feel it is extraordinarily important that we take uh, into account our overall um, global benchmarked environment and act accordingly because uh, uh, I don't want to say whether we are going to sacrifice our judicial independence etc. We should uh, see what other countries are doing which are like-minded in approach yeah. in terms of uh, the framework of production and framework of business decisions and so on and do something similar. But could you convince the finance minister over the last decade, uh, you know you worked with Mr. Chidambaram for a long time, were you able to convince uh, him that, that this is not uh, you know giving up on India's sovereignty uh, the, and this is an international best practice because yesterday uh, at a panel discussion Joint Secretary Akhilesh Ranjan told us that, that, that we are very clear that arbitration is a no-go and you have the Indian uh, Minister of State for Finance Ms. Nirmal Sitaraman making an intervention at a G20 meet that arbitration uh, is something that India is completely opposed to. Yeah. 
the point is I don't want to bring in personalities but what I can say is that India in my experience has or had existed in a very uh, enclosed um, uh, non-adversarial maybe but enclosed framework and environment for uh, always the change has come only from 19 uh, from 2006 7 okay. where we are comparing ourselves with the rest of the world so there's a learning process going on so, so can i just fine tune it yeah uh, very interesting right? uh, in fact arun uh, in the talk report it was not just having con papers on contentious issues but yeah. we said that even a new law like gar yeah. should be accompanied with position papers so that you don't start off with litigation is it right sir absolutely the, on position papers again we have said there should be position papers coming from the boards on a regular basis and the tax department have to abide by these position papers not with caveats at the are end are you happy that's happening yeah, there, there are some more now. I mean, uh, I'm very happy that they are taking it, but there have to be many, many more. A country like Australia has hundreds. We have <laughs> nine or ten yeah. uh, annually. So we have to, and they have to be clear. They, and the department has to say this is the final word. So in the field, the TP or the transfer pricing officer, the assessing officer, they will say yes, this is our guide guideline. This is what we follow. We then you don't have on the same issue different AOs and different uh, transfer pricing officers giving different uh, views, and so the whole thing today is very very heterogeneous. And for the for the taxpayer, for the business decision maker, it is a very difficult um, circumstance. And I think the board is taking the first small steps. The boards, however, it has to happen in a much deeper much more extensive and much more long-run manner. Who will drive that? Uh, will they, that? Does that have to be driven by the finance minister himself? I think ultimately it has to be overseen by the finance minister, but a, a finance minister of a complex country like India has such a big brief that he could have a steering committee, he could have uh, a kind of a group. A committee take, like that you chaired? Yeah, I mean, someone else uh, doing all this kind of work. I mean, we've given, the whole commission has given the full framework, the roadmap. You know, there are uh, four reports, 15 chapters. And it, so, if, if you don't, and we have said, please do everything and we've given you a roadmap. So, there has to be a group maybe of younger people who have a longer run to go and so on and so forth who will actually do this and it can be done in cooperation with the department that's why we went in fact to all eight different metros to take feedback from the field and i was completely frankly shocked as to how much support yeah. there is in the field of in, in, in taking these actions even up to the principal chief commissioners saying we need this we need this so it's my bias we are on implementation yeah, yeah. Uh, the one question that is getting asked and particularly since you know you have kind of finished your work and given the track record of implementation of expert committee recommendations to what extent is there a commitment by the present government for implementation of the report personally I do not doubt it that the government is committed but I also feel that if this has to be done in a fashion as it was intended there should be an oversight committee or there should be a powerful body like Niti or someone having an oversight on implementation of recommendations. Otherwise, this would be like any other committee report which will gather dust in government offices. You know, I, I tend to agree um, in the sense that um, uh, your, your sentence is very, very specific and telling. Huh. But I'm, I'm saying that I totally agree that if Niti is looking at um, uh, real policy thought and, and so on and so forth, that could be one place where it resides. Right. But there has to be a committee or even a, a repeated commission with the kind of powers that our commission had with full mm. access and so on and so forth. That will be given a brief or a portfolio of five years exactly as to we have given to oversee this. And to really put it in the field and to do it in cooperation with the departments. But the but I thought I must confess that I don't agree with the while I don't have any doubt on the commitment of government. But this is a, a report uh, uh, or reports which uh, which are not to be under examination. Exactly. They have to be implemented you now. You can't second guess now. Dr. Shum, direct tax court. You had different finance ministers bringing their own versions of DBC. You had so many drafts. Then you had quite a lot of provisions included in the Income Tax Act in finance bills. 
Now, finally, the finance minister is saying that the current income tax law is settled. Whatever amendments need to be brought in, we will bring it in the current uh, income tax act. We don't need DTC. The industry is also singing the same tune. Everyone is saying, let's go with the current act. Why this sudden change of heart? And are you disappointed because you championed DTC for a simpler code? Well, I'm uh, not disappointed because I'm ever optimistic, and I don't <laughs> believe that it is buried. I think it will be, it will go on. Uh, not resurrected, maybe as a whole, but the components all have to come. Nevertheless, I do think that lots of elements of the 2009 as well as 2013 DTC have not yet been take, taken. For example. Uh, for example, there's a premium, uh, you know, tax on insurance premiums, and then you completely, um, uh, 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 completely, oh, CFC, uh, uh, then the CFC rules, uh, whether they will come under GAR or not, or in what form. There are so many different things are there. How do you uh, uh, reformulate your dividend uh, tax? And uh, fundamental changes are right. wealth tax, where we said that wealth tax would be 0.25 percent and would include financial and non financial wealth and that so there are several elements whether we agree or not they have to be considered sure. and so I believe still there could be in a way good that this thing is dumped but there is it can, there can be two ways one is to resurrect yeah. and do a new one in the right manner or fill in the blanks and do everything because it's not yet finished the job is not yet finished Dr. Shom GST yeah uh, you know you've kind of spent a lot of time particularly in your first term with insofar as debates at the empowered committee is concerned leaving politics of gst on the side with respect to whether states will support the gst constitutional bill or not the larger sentiment is that this government has done a lot more than the earlier government and let me try and illustrate it by saying on compensation formula there is a greater degree of uh, conciliation now between the federal government and the state governments and perhaps to try and get the uh, uh, non-center ruling states on board. What would you say in terms of putting bets? Because some people believe that 2016 is still an over-optimistic date to implement. I think I would not like to say at the moment, let's postpone from 2016. However, I'm not yet certain whether all the inputs that are essential for in less than one year now, we can really put in, put in not just all the bills to be passed in every state legislature, but also in terms of the technical content. Right. And then there are structural issues which they have all accepted, which I believe as a technician are not very good. I mean, leaving certain major elements out of the base. Mm -hmm. So there will be built in cascading. For illustration. Uh, for uh, petroleum is the major thing. So you are completely taking it out of the supply chain and information chain. Right. And uh, whether you say at the moment we will keep it uh, uh, out of the net, I don't know what that means. Is but it zero rated or exempted? And uh, so I mean, that is one technique. Quickly picking up uh, Dr. Shom's thought on a 27% rate, uh, industry again uh, isn't sure that, uh, you know, uh, six months later you may have the industry come back and say, oh, let's retain the excise and customs and service, let's retain and then not go for the GST if this is the way it's going to come. No, that is what I'm saying, that why do we want to move away from this uh, uh, hodgepodge that we have today, VAT, SINVAT, uh, service tax, CST, you yeah. know, why? You must make a overall structure on the basis of which businesses will have easier and more rational uh, framework on which to make business decisions. On, on, on current evidence, you don't think that is what is going to come out? No, I feel it will, there will be an improvement. But I feel uh, there will be an improvement, but the, uh, the improvement will be marginal. And this is the time that the bullet should have been bitten right. to move a little more forward. Dr. And I think they have the support and they have the support, but I suppose they are doing this and on compensation and all that, I quite agree. But uh, these uh, elements, well, there are some political issues, etc. I want to, do, sure. uh, there's no point in expanding because this is not sure. the place to do that. Dr. Shaw, moving away uh, from uh, GST, yeah. uh, tax on uh, indirect transfer of assets, uh, you know, which in my view, personally, I felt uh, really dented the country's reputation uh, insofar as competitiveness of a tax system is concerned, whether because of retrospective law or whatever you call it. 
the expert committee that submitted its report, uh, the finance minister in this year's budget has implemented uh, part of that report. But some people still believe that some elements of that report have been left out. There are still some issues to be sorted out. Your quick reactions on that? Yeah, I mean, uh, the they have gone a long way. The, I think one of the limitations was that there are some uh, matters, cases under dispute. Uh, but uh, we had said, you know, retrospective uh, application or retrospective amendments should be done away with to the extent feasible. And if it is not, then the any retrospective amendments should, uh, I mean, any uh, amendments of, uh, on indirect transfers and so on and so forth, all of these should not be applied retrospectively. And I think that from what I'm seeing, there are certain cases that are coming up which say that, well, these are, we have imported them from before. Mm. So they are still being applied in a retrospective manner. And that I find is, uh, I'm wondering uh, whether that uh, necessary analysis is being carried out, which would give that confidence to investment, whether it is foreign investment, domestic investment, I'm not so concerned about it, that we can make a decision today and tomorrow we will not be told that yesterday the law was different and you didn't know about it. Now we are telling you this is the law. So that is what worries me and I don't think I'm as yet convinced that even though they have uh, taken note of some of the recommendations of the committee, I am not sure that I can say I'm confident that it is 100% okay. And uh, and this is, again, not a matter of administration vis-a-vis -vis invest investors, community, and who is better, who is more efficient, who is more... Thing. It is, where is the macro economy going? Mm -hmm. And I believe the tax administration should go for tax evasion and be a supportive instrument and tool in the country's growth. I mean, there's no... I, I cannot be convinced after, you know, my uh, looking at so many administrations, etc., that they are an entity by itself. I mean, they are not. They are a part of the uh, uh, the machinery of government to minimize tax gap, but not to make a, a retrospective this thing if they, if a, a, a case is lost in, in in court. Those are the kinds of things I I hope that the government is really going to catch the bull by its horn and 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 bring it to force, bring it to real control and, and, and deliver to the taxpayer and the investor that detail and that I'm waiting for. But I've not given up hope certainly, I'm very hopeful that it will happen. So I want you to uh, you know, elaborate on whether it's better to do away with GAR altogether than keep postponing it every two years. I no, mean, no, no. Gar, aren't we convinced about it? Yeah, GAR, we, we are convinced about it. GAR is an excellent instrument. The world is adapting, adopting GAR. We certainly cannot just have SAR or the specific anti avoidance rules. The transfer pricing is not enough. There are constructs that are made by international companies to minimize tax uh, in a very egregious manner. So we cannot do away with GAR because GAR at, uh, attracts and, uh, and, and, and contests those kinds of things. However, the main challenge for us is it should be applied only in the right way the way transfer pricing adjustments have been applied is not correct at all because we are way outside the map globally in terms of the number of transfer price adjustments and disputes that have been caused. So for GAR, we need appropriate preparation until that preparation and training of officers take place, I think we should not apply it. Dr. Shom, uh, your last fourth part of the report uh, did talk about one of the most important uh, lacunas, if I may use that word, in our tax policy. Revenue forecasting, predictive analysis, tax governance. Uh, though the report was submitted a few days before the budget, it seems that the finance minister heard it even before that. Because this year, for the first time, uh, I saw that the revenue forecasting was much more rational and much more predictive in nature. Very modest. And very modest as well. Uh, one, it signals acceptance of what you have been talking about. But do you see this trend continuing because the government has an equally big challenge to be able to manage the fiscal deficit and, uh, you know, uh, you know, revenue deficit and improve uh, the tax collection base. How do you see this panning out in the future? Yeah, the whole package that came in the budget, I think, was much very rationalized. For example, expenditure also was controlled in some 
areas where subsidies were unproductive, they have been cut down. In other areas, subsidies have been targeted towards the most vulnerable. So good. And accordingly, the revenue could be adjusted. So it is an excellent move. But the revenue method, projection method is still a point estimate method. Exactly. So what we have said in the TARC report in a whole chapter, how to do revenue forecasting and move have a moving revenue target over the year following the economic cycle. Yeah. And there are so many administrations with so many methods that do it and we've provided that. So that has to be done. That has to be quickly established. A department has to be established doing that. We've said exactly how the department should be established. But at the same time, I must say that this budget has shown that the heart is in the right place. But now the head has to construct the framework rightly. So on that note, possibly uh, we should end uh, uh, and uh, thank you very much for your time and more importantly, uh, congratulations and best wishes on your new role and responsibility and I believe you're moving locations as well. To Bangalore. <laughs> yes. I'm hoping better climate. So, so our next tax, the, walk, the tax walk will be in Bangalore. At, at the Kaban Garden maybe. <laughs> that will be a longish walk. <laughs> thank you very thank much. So thank, much. You. Thank, thank you. 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 Thank you.